and welcome back to another episode of Unapologetically Joy. I'm Joy, I'm the host of this podcast and we have another special guest today and her name is Ellie and she has a really interesting story to share with us today and Ellie is a Reiki master and also the host of the Speed Bumps podcast where she is inviting interesting guests to share their speed bumps in life and eventually to inspire people to be yeah, more vulnerable. So um, welcome, Ellie. Thank you. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome. Um, yeah, I was listening to your podcast and I thought, wow, you have been going through a lot, <laughs> uh, a lot of speed bumps. So, um, and you said you had 17 surgeries. Yep. <laughs> it's crazy. And um, yeah, and it all started when you were born, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was born in 91. So like they had ultrasounds, but my parents didn't, they thought that I was going to have a perfectly healthy baby uh, and I was anything but. So when I came out, the first thing that was super obvious is I have a radio clubbed hand. So what that means for your listeners is you have two bones in your forearm. Your forearm is the part of your arm that goes from your wrist to your elbow. And you're supposed to have two bones. You're supposed to have your radius, which is on the side of your thumb, and your ulna, which is on the like side of your pinky. And for me, I just have my radius. In addition, it's shorter. And uh, where my – I don't have a thumb. And so where the index finger, uh, I guess, would line up with the inside of your arm, it was rotated all the way in. And when babies are – born, their bones are actually really malleable. They're not hard like the adults. And so they used plastic splints to make it look like a capital L. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that they quickly noticed when I was born was that I had some type of heart thing. And it turned out that I had Tritology of Fallot, which is four defects of the heart, five mm -hmm. holes in my heart, and a tight mitral valve. Wow. And so for the first seven months of my life, if I would have laughed or cried, I could have died because your heart is supposed to pump blood all the way through your body with every beat. Mm -hmm. And instead, what would happen if I laughed or cried is the blood would just pump between the chambers of my heart and not actually mm -hmm. oxygenate my body. And I would turn blue like the Smurfs. Wow. <laughs> Crazy. But how did your parents uh, deal with this? Because... A baby is crying and laughing all the time, right? I, I, I couldn't. And so it was very, they had to be very attentive. And so like they couldn't really play with me too much because I couldn't really laugh. And so the crying was the hardest part. Um, and I never wanted to sleep. So the only way to get me to sleep was, you know, to put me in the car seat and then drive me around. And that's how I would sleep. I didn't want to sleep in a crib. Uh, and... So there was many times where they'd be just be driving around and that's how I slept. Uh, and, and like you said, they couldn't let me cry. So it was, they were going to figure out anything they had to do. Um, I, God had to have a hand in it, to be honest with you, because like mm -hmm. you said, babies cry, babies laugh, babies, mm -hmm. all the things. So yeah. So you're supposed, to, you're supposed to be here. So I think you really have a mission here. Otherwise, uh, yeah, otherwise yeah. I don't know because it's crazy because, um, yeah, like you said, a baby is crying and laughing all the time. Right. And, um, and so how was your childhood? Because um, I really understand that it's really hard because also from your, with your hand, for example, you go to school, maybe people mm -hmm. are going to tease you with it because, uh, yeah, people can be so cruel sometimes, especially yeah. kids. Oh, yeah. And, um, so, yeah, how was it to grow up like that? Yeah, so uh, at seven months old, I had open heart surgery. And mm -hmm. so obviously I can laugh and cry now. And I'm very thankful that I haven't – I've only had that one heart operation at mm -hmm. seven months old. And other than that, I haven't had any other heart procedures. Um, and, yeah, like you said, growing up in school, kids are really, really cruel. And they would pick on me for my hand and then – because I didn't want to deal with them. I was the kid that was like, fine, I'm just going to go read books and not talk to anybody. And, you know, uh, and so then I got picked on for like things like that. They didn't use the word nerd, but basically like smarty pants or teacher's pet or like those are the things that I was called. Um, 
And then my sister also has cerebral palsy. And even though she didn't go to the same school as me, I forget how, but somehow these kids found out. And so then they make fun of me for her, even though they had never met her. And so kids are just, they're, they're great. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I was 10 at the time, nine or 10. And my aunt had saw this thing on Dateline, which is one of those like nightly news shows that used to be around. I don't know. Maybe it's still around uh, mm-hmm. because I'm in the U.S. And she had saw this doctor who had learned this Russian technique. And this Russian technique was first used on legs in like war wounds. So, like if they had gotten shrapnel and like part of the leg was missing and they were using it so the person didn't lose any length in their leg. It was called, I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to try the Zrilarov device. Okay. And uh, he went over there. He learned it from the guy who developed it. He came back and said, you know, dwarves could benefit from this or like little people. Um, Kids with like lower limb disabilities or discrepancies could benefit, but also kids with arms so like my hand they could straighten my hand they could lengthen my forearm and so he was the first person to my knowledge to use it on arms and the difference with arms versus legs is you touch a hot stove right you need to see if a blanket is soft or something is prickly or things like that whereas your feet you don't have as many nerve endings And when a leg is weight-bearing, they heal faster. So I was in the newish group of kids that was having this done. And what they did – are you queasy? Like, can you handle, like, a little bit of medical talk? Mm, Yeah, you can can go ahead. Okay. I don't mind. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Maybe maybe trigger warning. Maybe it's going to be a – it's a, it's a little a, a little gory. Um, maybe skip ahead like um, forty five seconds a minute. Okay. <laughs> um, but they surgically broke my arm. They drilled pins into my arm, and then because now the bone is broken, we would take a wrench, just like a wrench you'd find in a garage. Basically, it was a smaller one though, and we would turn these bolts and nuts three times a day, and it would slowly separate that broken bone. And as it separated the broken bone, it straightened my wrist. And at the same time, it stretched the skin, it stretched the muscle, the nerves, the tendons, the blood vessels, all the things. And that was the first round. And it took, I want to say like seven, six, seven months. It was supposed to be only three. And then, and that was May 2002 that started. And... The summer before eighth grade, so I think like May-ish, 2004, 2005, we did the whole process again, and this time they were going to lengthen my forearm and not just straighten my wrist, and uh, same process again, except this time I remember coming out of surgery, and I'm just looking at my mom, and I'm looking over my right shoulder, so the the arm that did not have surgery. And the doctor just asked me, can you feel that? And I just said, feel what? And my mom's face gets ghost white and everyone's like, oh no. And I remember I basically just fell back asleep because I went, you know, they knocked me out for surgery again. And when I woke up, they had cut me from just above my wrist to all the way down past my elbow. Um, Sometimes what can happen when you have surgeries is a thing called compartment syndrome and your arm just swells up really bad. And that's what was happening. Uh, Mm -hmm. It was cutting off the nerves and I couldn't feel my hand. Mm. Wow. Crazy story. And, um, and how is your hand now? Can you just do whatever or? Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it never moved like yours would or my right hand would, um, I joke the only really things I can't do are ride a motorcycle and do monkey bars. Okay. But everything else, I figure out a way to do it. It's, it may look different than you do. Um, I actually, I haven't posted on it in a long, long time. But I have a YouTube channel 
called One Thumb L. And I would just post a video of how I tie my shoes, how I braid my hair, because I didn't have those things as a growing up. Yeah. Right. Um, I had to learn it all myself. And so the, there's these parents and these kids who or mainly the parents who recognize that they want to help their kids, but they're like, I have these two thumbs. I don't, I, you know, they try, but they can't always do it. So they can go to my page and I show them how I tie my shoes. Maybe is that the way they're going to tie their shoes? Maybe, maybe not, but it'll give them a different way of looking at it. Um, I show them how I braid my hair, uh, how I ride a bike, just like a regular um, bicycle and things like that, that I wish I had had. So really? when I was in school and I had that frame on my arm, the kids didn't make fun of me for that. They thought that was cool. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's nice. And um, yeah, of course, I was also listening to your podcast and um, you were also telling that um, also teachers were thinking that you cannot do any anything like, yeah. for example, typing or that oh, kind yeah. of stuff, you know? Yeah. And I thought it was like so crazy because these are just normal adults, you know, like yeah. get over it. But how was that period for you? There were some teachers, like you said, that uh, they just, they thought because that my arm looked different, that it affected my mental capabilities. And a lot of people can have that assumption. And a lot of times it's not the case. Uh, so you'd brought up my computer typing teacher. I was at the age where computers were fairly new and typing was new. And you know, you're supposed to put your, was it your thumbs on the space bar and like certain fingers on certain keys. And that's how we were taught to type. Well, how I typed was I would, cause this, my arm was still kind of bent at this point, like the capital L. And so I would take my left hand and wrap it around the top. And so it would be like, if my R, uh, how do I explain this? I've never explained this on a podcast. <laughs> it's like they wrap it would wrap around the top so I would type from the top but it looked normal to me and so then my right hand would just type like you and the only reason she wanted to put me in a special group was because my hand position was different I typed just as fast as everyone else if not faster I was just as accurate as everyone else if not more accurate and she kept wanting me she's like oh no we don't have to grade you and I was like why mm -hmm. oh well your hands aren't in the right place I'm like so like she could put the keyboard cover where you couldn't see the letters and I'm still getting it all right. Like it didn't matter. And my mom talked to her, the principal talked to her, my regular teacher talked to her. Yeah, I was in fifth grade and she just was convinced she was doing the right thing. And I was a very meek child. I didn't like speak out really against adults. I'm just kind of let them be ignorant. But this one it was like the third time of her saying, oh, no, you have to do it this way. And I remember going, no, I don't. And I start to walk out of the room. And everyone knows you can't just walk out of a classroom. You know, you have to have the teacher's permission. And she's like, where are you going? I was like, I'm going to the office and calling my mom. You can't do that. Oh, yeah? Well, watch me. And I <laughs> – and she's just like – because yeah. I was the teacher's pet. And the teacher's pet just in five-year-old language – said no and i don't know if i can swear so f you and in mm, fifth grade language like and she was very surprised mm -hmm. and what kind of school did you do uh, back then that was in a private catholic school through one month of eighth grade and because i got teased so much um in the private catholic school they my mom pulled me out and transferred me to the public school At one point, I was being teased so much, I had like a softball-sized bald spot on the back of my head where my hair was falling out because I was so stressed. Wow. That's so crazy. Yeah. Wow. That's really bad. And um, you always had this passion for science, right? And for Yeah. 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 Being around doctors all the time and putting my heart in my hand and, you know, all the other things. I had tonsils taken out as a kid and... I always had ear infections. So I was like at the doctor all the time to the point that in high school, 
uh, you're only allowed like 10 absences before uh, you're considered like truant or like basically you then get detention if you get more than 10 absences. But they're supposed to be excused if you go to the doctor and you have a doctor's note. So I'm on the honor roll, basically straight A student, all the things. And I had gotten my 10 absences and I had another one scheduled for a doctor appointment. They're like, if you take that, you're going to get suspended. And I remember coming home and crying to my dad. And I'm like, they're going to suspend me because I had to go to the doctor. And he basically called and yelled at him and is like, what are you doing? Like, she's not just skipping school for fun. Uh, I mean, that's how often I was at doctors. And I wanted to understand, I didn't want to be a doctor, didn't want to do the patient thing, but I wanted to understand why people got sick. Mm. So I went into science. I went in, I loved biology, uh, like cell biology, microbes, things like that. And that's what I got two degrees in. And I thought I was helping people. I thought I was doing something good. When the world went crazy, uh, realized maybe that's not the case. And I had been working in pharma from 27, January of 2017 to April of 2021. And, you know, grad school before that. And I up and left in April because of all the things that I was hearing and seeing and realizing. And uh, I was already involved in Reiki and energy crystal or energy healing and crystals and essential oils and all these things. And so I left and I was like, I, I can't. That science at that point. I realized how fake it was and people are going to think that, that sounds absolutely crazy, but the papers that a lot of people cite, they're not this gold. A lot of them aren't this gold standard. You can be paid to write things. You can change data uh, to make it look how you want. And that was really eye opening to me. I remember taking my first day of statistics in grad school, the professor said, there's lies, there's damn lies, and then there's statistics. He's like, you can make the numbers look any way you want to. And I didn't fully understand that until basically 2020. That's so interesting. And it's such a big shift, right? From the vaccine industry and now a Reiki master, I think it's uh, it's uh, really... Uh, cool shifts like you really now understand how it's working and the world is working right now and um but when did you realize that everything that the medical school was teaching you was not about helping people so when things first started to go crazy like february march and we're being told that uh masks you don't need to wear them. Um, you know, there was no talk of quarantines yet or lockdown. Like it was just those kind of crazy videos from China where people were just supposedly dropping dead in the streets. So go back to that time before we understood everything else. Because I had, like you said, worked with vaccines. I had worked with respiratory diseases. Um, and I'd worked with, in the U.S., potential bioweapons to try and understand them. So I had a pretty good grasp on if this was what they were claiming, what we should be doing. But what they were saying what we should be doing was not what I knew and had experienced in the lab. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, what they're saying doesn't make any sense. And so I was getting us those actual masks that work, the N95s, when they were saying, you don't need to wear masks. And I was having us wear them because that made sense. Mm -hmm. Well, then as the data started to come out of actually how bad it was, and it was more just like the cold, I was like, we don't need the masks. Like, we'll, we'll be fine. Yeah. But that's when they're like, oh, no, you need them. And I was like, wait a minute. 
this and then the lockdowns didn't make sense and the whole 14 days didn't make sense and then the whole well if you're even if you're asymptomatic which means no symptoms you can still give it to someone and i was like no that's that's not science yeah that is f- completely false <laughs> And yeah. so when they're coming out with all these things and I'm like, that's, n- that's not true. You know, I, I opened my immunology book, you know, an actual book that they can't go and change. And I'm like, I'm reading and I'm like, no, coronavirus, common cold. I'm like reading all of these things. Not that I didn't already know them, but I'm like showing my husband and things like that and friends. And I'm like, look, look. And uh, it just became so obvious it it became so obvious and then yeah. if they would lie about this what else would they lie about yeah true well it turns out in my opinion mm-hmm. uh they lied about in a lot of people's the safety of all jabberwockies i don't know if i can say the v word can i say mm-hmm. the v word uh yeah of course <laughs> all right so it, they basically lied about all the vaccines in my opinion mm-hmm. um she only does the us ones but you can get a feel for them. Uh, just the inserts.com or on Instagram is how what really opened my eyes. It was a completely unbiased look at that little folded up piece of paper that you get with any medication um, that everyone just throws away. And it really opened my eyes because I was like, wait a minute. These things like... She, she doesn't just do vaccines. That's how she started. But she also does like the ty- different types of birth control or she did baby aspirin or Miralax, like things that we're just told are completely safe for m- most people are, but not everyone's the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Right? Like not everyone can wear this, the same style of pants or the same manufacturer of pants. Like there's different ones or... Like, not everyone can be a blonde because they look – it's things like that. Like, nobody is the same. Heck, some people can eat peanuts and some people, if they smell them, they'll die, right? Not mm-hmm. everyone's the same. And also the PCR test, right? That's also uh, a funny one. <laughs> yeah, that uh, that one's BS. Yeah. Um, it's used in the lab to – for like laboratory research, it was never meant to be used as a diagnostic tool. Um, it just, it, it, it wasn't. And I don't know the terms in Europe, but in the U.S. it's emergency use authorization, then EUA, which means we provided a little bit of data but because there's an emergency, we can, we're just going to let you use it. In the past, EUAs were given to things like someone who had stage four cancer, and they're going to likely die no matter what, but they want to try this drug that isn't typically used for cancer. And the FDA will go, okay, like extreme use, you can try it. Or a really small group of people. That's what it had been used for in the past. It had never been used in this way. And so it was. It, it was used in a way that people were like. They never heard of it. They didn't understand the process. And they just assumed. Because the media can twist things. That. Well the FDA approved it. No it's EUA approved. It's not. It didn't run the full clinical trials. It didn't do all the tests to prove what it claimed. And now, I don't know about you, but PCR tests don't really happen in the U.S. anymore. Like, they just kind of went poof, and no one yeah. talks about them. Yeah, I'm really happy about that. But um, I think it's uh, it's coming again because, for example, I live now in Spain. Mm-hmm. But, uh, I'm from Holland originally, and they're starting to do the test again. So... Yeah, I'm really scared of uh, maybe the future that's going to be a test again or maybe we have to have the vaccine passport again because, for example, I cannot travel now to uh, the U.S. 
I yeah. need to have two vaccines, I guess, or maybe three yeah. already. Um, so I think it's really hard uh, to travel, but yeah, I still try to uh, go to places and uh, because I really like my freedom, you know. And uh, before, yeah, yeah, I, before. Um, oh, sorry, no, no, keep going. <laughs> before I was really fighting against the government, and I was almost like. I was trying to convince everybody, you know, that everything is bullshit. But uh, one day I just realized, okay, some people never going to make this shift and that's okay. And um, and how was that for you? Did you also lost friends or maybe you got into fights with family members? Or I'm very blessed that I didn't experience that. Um, I had... We ended up having a family reunion of August of 2020, and there were some people that, uh, were, even though it was completely outside, uh, like they were trying to like wear masks, they didn't want to hug. And I, in my head, I'm like, that's ridiculous. But no one really got in fights about it. Um, no one. I know a lot of families had the polarization of like, if you don't get this, you can't come to Christmas dinner, and. I never experienced that, thankfully, but I know a lot of people did. Mm -hmm. uh, I had an aunt and uncle who they ended up getting the first two from Pfizer and thankfully they're okay. And they did it because um, they're older. They have some health complications and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I told them not to, but they're like, no, we really think this is the right thing. And Okay. Mm -hmm. And then shortly after that, a bunch more data came out and they're like, we're not getting any boosters. We're not. No, absolutely mm -hmm. not. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get it for the vaccine passport because for a while that was a thing in the US. And they were going to New York. And so at this point, uh, they had it. They could have traveled freely in New York. And my husband had served, or not my husband. Well, yes, my husband too. But my uncle had served in the United States Marine Corps. And he was going to go into a restaurant or something. And they're like, oh, you need to show us your card. And he could have. He could have easily did it. And he's like, I served in the military, so I wouldn't have to do this. Basically, F off. Like, no, we're leaving. Um, I literally fought so people didn't have to do this. And those are the people that I guess I'm most proud of because mm -hmm. they made a decision at the time that they thought was best for them. Mm -hmm. And even though I didn't agree, they never one way or the other was upset at anyone, but mm -hmm. they never stood for the isolation and discrimination of those who chose not to get it. Mm -hmm. I think everyone yeah. should be able to make their own choice. Mm -hmm. I may not agree with you, but we should be able to have a conversation like we are right now. Mm -hmm. yeah it's very important yeah you know and if we choose not to then and we're clearly healthy like you you shouldn't make us test you like you shouldn't put all these extra things on us i don't know if it's making news in spain but i guess there's like a it's called like the g20 summit right now and i guess Everyone just agreed that we all need a vaccine passport and it's going to be universal, just mm -hmm. like the passports that we need to travel internationally. And I'm just like, mm -hmm. that's, that's not going to go well in the U.S. I know in some countries, maybe it'll go over easier. In the U.S., though, it's not. Mm -hmm. That's good. But I think what a lot, of, un unfortunately, the people where it's not, they're not going to try, in my opinion, implement it across all 50 states in the U.S. to travel it like, from state to state. Instead, it's going to be if you want to go to Canada or you want to go to Europe or things like that. Well, from what I've learned, the people who don't want the Jabberwockies, they don't really want to go outside the U.S. anyway. Mm -hmm. so i i don't know i don't know yeah it's scary yeah it is and um i really want to go to america one day but 
um, for now it's not possible for me, but yeah, that's just how it is. And this is the choice I made and I have to accept the consequences and, um, I can still, still travel in Europe. So, yeah, I know there's some people who've, they've, I don't know what exactly they've done, but they have been able to travel and whether it was like a religious exemption or a medical exemption or both, and they have gotten into the U S and or Canada, um, cause at the time Canada had it for a long time too, but it was a lot of hoops to jump through and you have to do it like exactly the right way. Um, I don't know. Are you originally from Holland? Yeah. Yeah. I was born there. Yeah. Okay. So is that where like all your family is now? Yeah. Or did they move yeah. to Spain? No, I moved to Spain with my best friends because uh, I really want to live at the beach. It was always my dream. So that's why I moved there. And um, yeah, it's really nice. It's uh, it's lovely here. And a, be- a better weather too. And Holland is always cold. So uh, yeah, I like it. If, uh, I know at one point in Europe, like they had it where you couldn't travel between countries. Like if they're like, okay, and I'm going to make up some data. If they're like on this date, if you're still here, like, you know, then you're going to need that Vax passport to travel. Would you go back to Holland to be with your family or would you stay in Spain? Uh, good question. Yeah. Then, um, I don't know. I go by boat or something. Okay. I just do whatever it takes. But um, for me, yeah, taking a test is already a big thing for me. But if I need to do it to see my family, then I will do it. And like you also said, like, I also had to do tests when I was going to a Christmas dinner, for example. And I was like, I'm not going to do that, you know? Yeah, no. So... Um, I really accept the choices my family is making, but for me, I just choose for myself and that's really important for me. And, um, yeah. And that's what I also like about you. You know, you just choose for yourself and you stand up for yourself. And now you're this striking monster. It's like the, like the opposite almost. Yeah. And I really feel like this is a really big part of the medical industry that they are missing because they don't work with energy. Agreed. And, um, but how did you learn to become a Reiki master? So at the end of 2019, I met my now husband, I was going through a divorce and at this point I'm still very much in Western medicine is good. That mindset. And He's like, you're really stressed. Uh, how about you go for a Reiki? And I was like, I don't believe in that. Like, that that's a bunch of woo-woo BS. Like, no. And he's like, I'm going to pay for it. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to go lay on a table and relax for an hour. Maybe fall asleep. I'm like, all right. And I didn't research it, which is weird because I research everything all the time. And I went there. She also did tarot, but she knew things that she couldn't have possibly have known. And it wasn't in this vague way. It was like some very specific things that he didn't know at the time, wasn't on social media. Like you had to have, she would have to have some type of very intimate knowledge that few people had. So it took me probably two months or so to process that entire experience and just I couldn't even articulate to him all my questions. I didn't because I just had so many. And there was one night his back started to hurt like really, really bad. And it was after I'd done this Reiki and I was like, can I just try something? And he's like, sure. So he lays down on the ground and I basically do Reiki without knowing I'm doing Reiki or energy healing or whatever you want to call it. Reiki is just another term for energy healing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, I'm not massaging with my hands. I'm just kind of like placing my hands on his back in certain places. And I'm, I'm feeling like my hands get hot and I can like feel this energy moving and I don't know what I'm doing. It's very natural. 
And after a short period of time, I was like, okay, so how do you feel? He's like, I feel a lot better. He's like, what did you do? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I just, that's what (laughs) was supposed to happen. And he's like, well, you definitely did something. And him and I took our, because there's three levels of Usu Reiki together. So we did Reiki one in February of 2020 before the world went crazy. And then we did Reiki 2, I have to look, I want to say probably the end of 2020, like the fall, winter of 2020. And then we did Reiki 3 shortly thereafter, I think. And, but for me, Reiki... I definitely learned things, but it, I don't do Reiki the way a lot of people do Reiki. For me, it's very intuitive. Mm-hmm. Um, I go by what I'm field called, my, my intuition, like whatever at the time. And him and I will actually sometimes do it together on someone. So he tends to be electricity. I tend to be fire. We don't tell people what they should feel or what they should expect, but every single person describes it the same way. And we know who's who because we'll be like, yeah, one person was at my head and I felt this and the other person was at my knees and I felt this and they would describe our movements and their eyes would be closed, but it would just be the fire versus electricity. Wow. So it's really cool when him and I do it together and like you said, the West, Western medicine, they don't take that into account. And I'm not saying Western medicine is bad, totally has its place. Uh, I would be dead without it. Mm-hmm. But they did a study where they told cancer patients, like, okay, imagine the immune cells in your body are like a little army, you know, fighting the cancer. And then they had, you know, the other group just do like a mindfulness meditation type thing. And the ones that actually pictured their cells fighting or the chemo fighting the cancer tended to do better. Or they had less side effects and things like that. So Mm -hmm. we always hear that mind over matter or it's all in your mind or things like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is. Yeah. A a lot of it is. Yeah, and do you also feel like, maybe it's a really big statement, but that chemo is placebo effect? What is placebo? In chemo. I don't even think it's placebo. I think it's like dropping a nuclear bomb in your body, and maybe it's doing a little bit of good at some point, uh, but for the most part, it's poison. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot better ways in because here's my thing in placebo you shouldn't be being harmed mm-hmm. yeah placebo would be like i have this crystal and i have a headache and i'm gonna put it on my head and the headache gets better well mm-hmm. i'm not harmed mm-hmm. if yeah. it doesn't work right yeah. and so is it placebo that the crystal worked because it's all in my head or did the crystal actually work i don't know but either way i'm not getting hurt yeah. Chemo, in my opinion, is just poison. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I feel that too. So um, where do you feel that diseases come from? It comes from your mind or is it, it's, what do you think? So there's definitely, and people have different theories. Some mm-hmm. So there's germ theory where, There's only bacteria and viruses and fungi, and that's what makes you sick. And then some people believe in only terrain theory, which is if your mind is clear and your body is clear, like you have a clear fish tank, you can't get sick. I'm kind of in, I'm in the middle because if you're eating junk food all day, you know, and you have all this inflammation in your body, your joints are going to hurt and you're going to have these quote unquote diseases, but that's because of your internal environment isn't very good. But I like I also know that bacteria exist. 
and mm-hmm. fungi exist and parasites. And I'm doing more research on viruses because that's what's the one everyone wants to debate me on is the whole virus piece. But there are microbes that exist. So both can happen. Mm-hmm. And I'm not in this one camp or the other. But there are certainly things that are all in your head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's, uh, for me, I, I think the same. It's like, maybe it's already there, but maybe you're activating it with like a bad mindset, you know? Mm-hmm. That's what I believe. And um, and you also said you're working with crystals, right? Mm-hmm. Um how do you use them in your um, um, yeah, clients? How do you use it with your clients? Um, so, like I said, I don't do Reiki like most people do Reiki. So, when I go to work on clients uh, before I leave, typically I only have one or two clients in a day. So, I grab some of the crystals I feel like I might need and I take them with me to the little place that I work at. And then I just kind of lay them out. And then if during that session, I feel called to use them, sometimes I place it on the client and I leave it there. Sometimes I use it to like draw energy out or put good energy in. Sometimes I will place them under because it's a massage table. I'll place it like under the massage table. Um, It's, it's so different. Intuition. (laughs) Yes. It, yes, exactly. Intuition. Mm -hmm. And how can you train your intuition? How do you, because I really feel like I also have a strong intuition, but sometimes my, my left brain, my analytical brain is, is like taking over and is more rational. And I find it hard sometimes to listen to this little voice. So I'm going to steal this from Lindsay Sharman who I heard her on uh, Expanding Reality Podcast. This is where I'm stealing this from. What she said was, say something that you know is absolutely true. Um, You know, I love my dog or, you know, I I love my spouse or I love something you know is absolutely true and see what that feels like. And she said, for a lot of people, You feel it, you know, up in the heart chakra, the top of your body, things like that. Notice what that feeling is like. Then say something you know is not true. I hate my dog. I hate my spouse. And then you'll feel it kind of in your stomach and you're like, oh, that's that's not true. And do it with things that you know are 100% true and 100% not true and notice those feelings. And then start to do it with things that maybe you're unsure of and see where that feeling hits. And I thought that was a really great way to do exactly what you said is how do I hone my intuition? Because mm. I think we all have that little voice. Sometimes it's just harder to hear. And so I absolutely loved that suggestion because we could do that all the time. We could do it when we're driving. We could do it when we're walking. We can do it in the shower. Like we could do it whenever. Wow. Amazing. So if you say something and you feel it in your heart, then you know it's it's true, right? That's what she said. She said every, people can be different. In general, it's mm-hmm. up in here. But say something that you know is true and notice where you feel it in your body. And then yeah. say something that you know is not true and notice it where you feel it in your body. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, it, and maybe it's you feel it in different hands. Maybe it's a headache. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, But do this, and so you know what true feels like to you and not true feels like to you, and then go from there. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, when I get stressed, I feel it in my jaw. So then I know it's a a bad sign for me. If I really have pain in my jaw, then I feel like, okay, this is maybe not a good decision for me, you know? Yeah. And and do you know where that comes from, Um, the jaw? Do you maybe have like... So jaw mm-hmm. in this area is typically like a throat chakra thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be that you should be speaking your voice and you're not, or yeah. typically that's what it is. Um, but some people, that's just where they feel, that's where their gut quote unquote is, their intuition. Like 
you walk down a road and you see someone and you're like, you get that creepy, like, oh, I should probably just turn around. Um, some people feel it in their gut. Some people, like you said, feel it in their jaw. Some people get like maybe a pain in the back of their head. Everyone's so different. Yeah. The thing is, it's a listening to those things that are consistent. And if you know that that's consistent for you, that's what's important to listen to. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Really good advice. So um, how do you, what do you do for yourself to feel connected to your intuition and to your inner self? I love essential oils. Um, it Like I have, I want to say a problem but I have a lot of them but I, and, but I use them and I use them in so many different ways <laughs> it, it kind of yeah kind of yeah but I'm also like teaching my stepdaughter how to use them and my husband how to use them so they're natural medicines they're but medicine isn't even the right word um, but I use that I have been fidgeting with this crystal it's a piece of jade that was hollowed out in three different ways oh. um so I, you know, I play with crystals. I, I, I'm feeling the sun on my face. It's getting colder here right now. Uh, so we're very much bundled up in winter coats and hats and gloves and all the things. But typically, your face is still exposed, and so I love just you know feeling the sun. I love going on drives and just listening to music or listening to nothing at all. That's my quote unquote way to meditate. I'm not the person that can just go sit and go ohm like that Mm -hmm. that's not me I need to be moving walking uh driving like doing something so wow really cool and I really feel like you really found your purpose in life and it's so different from where you come from and that's uh it's really funny actually (laughs) yeah I mean I always knew I wanted to help people that's why I went into science And I always say that's also why I left science, because I wasn't helping people. I was doing things that could potentially hurt people. And in my gut and for my morality, I couldn't do that. I didn't want to hurt anybody. And so Reiki and essential oils and crystals and energy healing and all of these things, maybe they're placebos. Maybe they are. But in my heart, I know they're not. And the people that I help, I don't. I don't think they feel it's placebo either because it's done things and healed them in ways that Western medicine can't. I've healed my way myself with oils and things like that. When Western medicine has told me, oh no, that that's not possible. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if that's placebo, I'll take placebo all day. <laughs> yeah. Never, if it works, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind too. If you believe in it, why not, right? Right. If it's working. <laughs> yeah, if, if it's working and doesn't hurt me, and there, why not? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is a, a really nice way to end this podcast today. And um, yeah, I think you really inspire people to be more close to themselves and just listen to your inner voice and just, um, yeah doing your own thing and that's uh, also the mission of my podcast so uh, thank you so much thank for you. your time and uh where can we find you you can find the speed bumps podcast on all major platforms if you want to be a guest please reach out and you can reach out on instagram at speed.bumps.podcast or my personal page is on instagram is o-n-e thumb e-l one thumb l Perfect. I will put it also in the description so they can get there. And uh, well, thank you so much for your time again. Thank you. uh, Thank you everyone for listening and I see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.